So, consider this part two, or another version of the Malthusian delusion. Um, but in this case, it's explaining uh, environmental Malthusianism and demography, how, how they historically uh, came to uh, came to form. And they are opposing things, actually. They aren't necessarily the same. But of course, the, the Malthusians are the ones who create the uh, demography status quo, at least from a philosophical standpoint, like, all right, abstract. As anthropogenic climate change threatens human existence on Earth, historians have begun to explore the scientific antecedents of environmental Malthusianism. The idea that human population growth is a major driver of ecosystem degradation and that environmental protection requires a reduction in human numbers. These accounts, however, neglect the antagonistic relationship between environmental Malthusianism and demography, thereby creating an illusion of scientific consensus. This article details the entwined histories of environmental Malthusianism and demography, revealing points of disagreement initially over methods of analyzing and predicting population growth and later over the role of the population growth in ecosystem degradation and moments of strategic collaboration that benefited both groups of scientists. It contends that the image of scientific consensus in existing histories has lent support to ongoing calls for population control, detracting attention from proximate causes of environmental devastation such as polluting uh, modes of production, extractive business practices, and government subsidies for fossil fuel uh, development. And uh, I don't know if this will cover this, but in 2003, I believe, uh, the carbon footprint, like for humans, I believe, not like the polluting industries, uh, was stacked on. Uh, so citizens, average people, individually are have the quote-unquote carbon footprint and so this is like a type of math that if you put it all together creates a large population footprint and so that's the excuse to sort of cut people off in the modern day world all right at the beginning of the 21st century, as anthropogenic climate change threatens human existence on Earth, many people in the U.S., at least many of those who acknowledge the reality of the crisis, accept as common sense that population growth drives this calamity and thus reducing the number of people on Earth would avert a mitig or mitigate harm. Some bioethicists argue that because we are threatening more than more with, uh, with more population than the planet can bear, humans simply don't have a right to more than one biological child. All right, so this book by Sarah Connolly, 2016, was actually crazy. Um, um, the one child basically talking about how, like, in some parts of the world, it was successful to have uh, mass sterilization. And she obviously points out that this is unethical because we live in a democracy. But like the birth earth, it talks about how things the state and the, uh, the government would do to its populace, but can't because it lives in a democracy. You know, you're literally two bullets from fine with that one. Some recommend that governments act to uphold this limit. Even feminist historians and sociologists of science, including some sharp critics of the population control project of the late 20th century, now call for measures to reduce childbearing as a means of combating climate change. Environmental Malthusianism, the idea that human population growth is the primary driver of environmental harms and population control, a prerequisite to environmental protection, is experiencing a resurgence. Over the past 20 years, historians have uncovered the intellectual, social, and political roots of environmental Malthusianism, tracing it to the first decades of the 20th century. While these accounts document the relationship between the environmental Malthusianisms and broader 20th century population movement, they generally overlook the tensions between environmental Malthusianisms promulgated primarily by natural scientists and demography, the quantitative social science of human population dynamics. By including only the very few demographers, 
tomographers who align themselves with environmental Malthusianism, most prominently Kingsley Davis. These histories create the false impression of scientific consensus regarding the relationship between human population and the natural environment. Historical critiques of population control further promote this illusion by conflating environmental Malthusianism and demography into an undefinitive population science. All right, so this may be off topic, but you know how it's like 99 or 90 something percent of scientists agree that climate change is real because of human causes. It's possible that the other few percent that don't agree are the ones that want to call humanity to get it done. I was just thinking of that because it is like very rich people. And so that, uh, that minority percentage is pretty suspicious. All right. Histories of demography, for the most part, largely ignore the natural environmental uh, and environmental Malthusianism. This omission makes sense, as demographers, social scientists who worked in and or received their graduate training in university-based population research centers, had little to say about the natural environment before the mid-1990s. Even as late, even as late as 2018, Amy Sue the outgoing president of Population Association of America, demography's primary professional organization, whoa, uh, acknowledged that the one area we, PAA, somehow never captured, and maybe we need a celebrity for this, so to speak, an advocate, is environment. Uh, I don't know. There's been plenty of, like, fictional characters and symbols of the environment and obviously like you know celebrities aren't even like real people since they're mostly seen for their I mean they're mostly only wanted through the algorithm to do the roles forever you know if Jim Carrey didn't quit or wait he's doing Fern Gully, Fern Gully last I knew but anyways like now that the they can just AI you, they don't even need your body anymore. So, I mean, celebrities are hardly the, the their own person. They are only their role. So, I, it would make sense. You could, like, <laughs> make Godzilla the fucking environmental advocate. <laughs> Anyways, that's stupid. Despite demographers' overwhelming silence about the natural environment. However, environmental Malthusianism was integral to the history of their field. Environmental Malthusianism generated public concern about overpopulation, which translated into massive funding for research and training in demography after World War II. It is likely because environmental Malthusianism, Malthusianism was such a boon to demography that demographers largely kept their scientific critique of environmental Malthusianism to themselves. This article traces the relationship between environmental Malthusianism and demography from the interwar period to the early 21st century, drawing on the archives of environmental Malthusianism's demographers and their employers and their funders, and on, hor and on oral history interviews uh, completed over the past 40 years. In so doing, it reveals more distance and op opposition between demographers and inter in, uh, environmental Malthusianism. Than, it, than historians and other scholars of population and the environment have previously recognized. It contends that since the 1920s, demography has taken a non-Malthusian approach to human population dynamics that continually changes facile equations between human population growth and environmental degradation. Further, it demonstrates that environmental Malthusianism, though often promoted by scientists, has been motivated more by opposition to environmental and economic regulation than by scientific analysis. This article focuses on U.S.-based actors because environmental Malthusianism originated in the United States and because during the period of analysis, most demographers published in English were trained in the United States. Um, okay, so I almost said something silly and said that China is probably a good Malthusianism, but, you know, 
that's the difference between the Malthusianism and the eugenics, because, you know, the Malthusians generally are global, and China was only engineering its own populations with the one-child policy, and as of recently, I believe there was a, a second and a third child policy just to get the population back up, but that's not working for them, so that's pretty off topic. Okay, the purpose of this article is not to valorize demography or to suggest that demographers got it right and environmental Malthusians got it wrong. Both groups of scientists promoted overpopulation narratives that attributed some of the world's most pressing problems to its most vulnerable citizens and justified repressive family planning and population control programs. For demographers, however, overpopulation was an economic phenomenon, not an environmental one. Critiques of demography's economic per aversion of population abound. This article focuses its critique on environmental Malthusianism, demonstrating that there has never been a scientific consensus about the relationship between human population and the natural environment. The interwar birth of population science. Histories of environmental Malthusianism typically begin between the world wars with two biologists, John Hopkins University, Raymond Pearl, and Harvard University's Enwood East. Uh, Pearl and his colleague, okay, formalized Malthus' theory that subsistence resources drives and constrain human population growth, while East, sorry, linked population growth to soil erosion and other signs of environmental degradation. Both men used their scientific credentials to call public attention to the threat of impending overpopulation in the United States. While existing histories have failed, often failed to acknowledge is that biologists were not the only scientists dealing with human population between the wars. Also in the 1920s, Metropolitan Life Insurance statistician Alfred J. Lotka and Louis I. Dublin developed a non-Malthusian approach to population growth that would form the ma mathematical foundation for demography. On the basis of their analysis, Lotka and Dublin challenged Pearl and East claim that the population of the United States was uh, growing too quickly. Demography was thus born from controversy at a time when science of human population was up for grabs. Scholars of science and technology studies uh, look to controversies as moments when the co-production of science and social order is uniquely visible and when politics get embedded into science in ways that could be harder to recognize after the controversy settles. That's so true. In the case of interwar population science, the biologists and statisticians developed competing population problemizations, in a term coined by Greenhow, uh, 2003, to refer to particular formulations of the population problem at hand, together with its solution that constitute a new demo demographic and policy re reality by shaping what is thinkable in the domain of population. Each problematization articulated a specific mode of data analysis to a specific population theory, generating divergent population problems with diametrically opposed solutions. As biologists working before the rise of what K1993 terms the molecular vision of life, Pearl and East focused on organisms, considering national populations, not the humans that comprise them, organic entities and therefore the appropriate level analysis. They conceptualized population change as a top-down process driven by the availability of subsistence resources. When resources were plentiful, population grew quickly, but when resources become scarce, growth slowed. They were not concerned with the vital processes that produced growth, namely birth, death, and migration, assuming that vital rates would adjust automatically to maintain the correct aggregate growth rate. Dublin and Lotka, on the other hand, specialized in death and its most reliable predicator, uh, predictor, age, extending life table analysis from mortality to fertility they found that births, too, were much more likely to occur at some ages than at others. Their level of population analysis was the age-specific vital rate. Uh, both 
anal analytic approaches indicated that although the population of the United States was still expanding, the rate of growth had started to slow after World War I. Uh, Brookings Institution statistician Robert Kutskin identified the same pattern in most countries of Western Europe. Biologists and statisticians signed on these empirical facts but interpreted slowing population growth very differently, drawing on competing population theories and exhibiting the kind of interpretive flexibility that Collins 1981 describes as characteristic of science in the making. Pearl, 1924, understood that decreasing the rate of growth in Malthusian terms, if populations inevitably grew to the limit of subsistence, a declining growth rate could only mean that the population in question was nearing its biological limit. The statistician interpreted the slowing of population growth through the lens of mercantilism, a population theory that anecdated, oh, antedated Malthus and cast population growth as a sign of good government and the primary source of economic uh, dynamism and geopolitical strength. Now, usually this is true, but um, it goes both ways depending on how they want their society to be. But I think cutting back on the population probably just doesn't solve anything, especially since more people would drive the growth, but all the growth is in the hands of the few. So the growth of the population, you don't get to see that because everything they do is technically just being transferred to the rich so they got nothing to show for it okay they attributed population change to a variety of social economic and political factors acting on vital rates and feared that declining rates of population growth in the united states and western europe would weaken those countries relative to the faster growing countries of eastern europe and east asia These theories pointed to the competing problem-solution pairings. For the Malthusian biologists, slowing population growth signaled impending overpopulation. For the mercantilist statistician, it signaled impending depopulation. In the early 1920s, these problems were underdetermined by the data. They depended on scientists' preferred population theory, which aligned with the scientists' position on immigration, one of the most pressing political issues in the United States after World War I. Industrialization had drawn workers from all over the world to the U.S., where race and national origin structured the labor market and constrained opportunity. As social inequality grew at the end of the 19th century, socioeconomic status became strongly correlated with race and national origin. In the first decades of the 20th century, many reformers began to locate the causes of poverty and its uh, soliloquy in the bodies of the poor, realizing that people from different parts of the world had different levels of innate quality. Pearl and East marshaled their predictions of impending overpopulation as evidence for their preferred solution to poverty, immigration restriction. Dublin, Latka, and Kursansky, all of whom had been born in Europe, though Latka to American parents, used their predictions of impending depopulation to advocate against immigration restriction. And despite this, <coughs> um, so usually immigration is just for better for the populace and for the workforce. You know, they come here for opportunities and we want them for the workforce. And so even though we're halting immigration, like we're doing right now after the pandemic at its peak, we still want our own birth rates. So there's this hypocrisy that's going on. Although we're still mass incarcerating the people that we don't want to have children and cutting, and cutting a chunk out of that populace. So that could be a reason that workforce that could be working isn't actually doing anything. Uh, Obviously, um, there's work and labor being done in prisons, but I don't know if that's the same unless the workforce that would be free is now the workforce that is in prison still doing its job for the economy.
You tell me in the chat if that's true. All right. Despite their competing approaches to population, Pearl, East Dublin, and Latka, and Kurtzansky worked together to establish the International Union for Scientific Establ Investigation of Population Problems, forerunner to today's International Union for Scientific Study of Population. In 1928, the PAA in 1931, oh, within the uh, International Union for Scientific Investigation and the PAA, the division between overpopulation and depopulation perspectives largely mapped onto age and disciplinary background. Biologists and older social scientists preferred Pearl and East aggregate approach to Malthusian theory, while statisticians and younger social scientists, particularly those with quantitative training, preferred Latka, Dublin, and Kutsansky's vital rate approach and mercantilist approach, or theory, sorry. This latter approach required considerable mathematical sophistication and was inscrutable to many biologists and older social scientists, e.g. Hankins, 1931. It was, however, more attractive to the private and public funders of population science, whose support went al almost entirely to the younger, mathematically oriented social scientists who had embraced Dublin, Latka, and, and Kersensky's vital rate approach to population analysis and the mercantilist perspective that traveled along with it. During the 1930s, these social scientists began to identify themselves and one another as demographers. Demographers' warning about depopulation became more plausible in the 1930s, when the, when the population of the U.S. grew more slowly than the biologists had predicted, despite abundant food resources. In the 1920s, Pearl and East had pointed to the temporal coincidence between the population growth and soil erosion in the U.S. as empirical evidence of overpopulation. In so doing, they el elided the fact that erosion resulted not from too many people subsisting on U.S. agriculture, but rather too many people trying to profit from it. In the first decades of the 20th century, American farmers aggressively mined the soil to produce grain from, for export, in the process undercutting more sustainable production methods in other countries. In the 1930s, demographers Pascal uh, Welpton, 1934, warned that slowing population growth would soon result in agricultural overproduction across North America and Western Europe. A few very much at odds with Pearl and East productions at impending food scarcity, but one that was born out during the Great Depression, when the U.S. government paid farmers to take land out of production to address erosion and resulting dust storms and to avoid price collapse. Millions of people starved not because there wasn't enough food, but because the market failed to allocate resources effectively, implicating the numerous uh, social, economic, and political institutions that mediate between population and food supply. Exactly. It's all just in the hands of one conglomerate. But, you know, the peons just get to be the scapegoat at the end of the day. Yeah. <sighs> Man, that's really annoying. I, and, you know, seeing this at work, seeing literally it looks like a whole plate of food being put into the tray. Like, this drives me insane. Oh, my God. And has nothing to do with population. It just... Of course. I mean, it plays the part in what we're doing with the food and the bodies that are, you know, they're involved, they're... It's not like there's no relevance to population to this. Anyways, as depopulation came to seem more plausible than overpopulation, he shifted his focus back to plant genetics, and Pearl realigned himself with demography, renouncing th theories he had previously espoused. By the time World War II began, the controversy over population science had reached closer. Social scientists became the primary authorities over human population in the United States, and their problematiza problematization of population excluded a Malthusian link between human population and the natural environment. However, 
the controversy had a long afterlife that continues to reverberate today. The survival of environmental Malthusianism. During the 1940s, okay, so, uh, even though this has been settled from an official way, the rich still get to decide whether this is true or not. So, it is sort of just juggling with the facts. And it'll always be like that for as long as we're in neoliberal deregulation, whether it's in the hands of a Democrat or a Republican. Like, it really doesn't matter. Anyways, the survival of envir environmental Malthusianism. During the 1940s, environmental Malthusianism remained alive at the margins of science, largely through the work of one man, anti-immigrant eugenicist Guy Irving uh, Birch, founder of the Population Reference Bureau. Though not a scientist himself, Birch aimed to present population science to the American public in ways that would promote the perception of a rapidly growing U.S. population straining at the limits of natural resources, thereby producing population support for the ongoing immigration restriction. In PRB materials and other publications of the 1940s, introduced the term population explosion to describe rapid growth of a population growth he predicted on the horizon at the same time that demographers warned of the threat of de depopulation and agricultural uh, overproduction uh, dis uh, Birch dismissed these warnings as efforts by small fry academics led by foreign-born scientists specifically naming Dublin and Kuczynski to discredit immigration restriction. In the second half of the 20th century, Bush and PRB facilitated the uptake of environmental Malthusianism by natural scientists, philanthropists, and businessmen. Immediately after World War II, Bush, together with sociologist Elmer Pendel, wrote a book that aimed to provide scientific legitimacy to eugenics and an immigration restriction in a post-Holocaust world. Initially self-published in 1945 under the title Population Roads to Peace or War, it was published in 1947 by Penguin as Human Breeding and Survival. Citing it to her publication by Pearl and East, the book contended that the world had already passed its carrying capacity. A number of Birch and Pendel in 1947 pinpointed at 2.5 billion. They gleaned this number from the fact that in 1940, when the Earth's population was around 2.5 billion, experts Bush and Pendel described as the technologists had claimed that the Earth could provide for everyone. People starved not because they were there were too many of them, but because the Earth's resources were not being distributed effectively. Birch and Pendel interpreted this claim to mean that 2.5 billion was the maximum number for which the Earth could provide. It was considerably lower than the 5.2 billion East 1923 had previously calculated as the Earth's carrying capacity. Currently, there is no scientific consensus regarding how many people the Earth can support, with estimates ranging from 500 million to well over 1 trillion. Birch and Pendel described the recent war as a natural result of population growth and therefore evidence of overpopulation. However, overpopulation was not limited to the belligerent powers they maintained. According to Bush and Pendel, Russia had turned to communism in response to population pressure. Even the United States was not immune. Drawing on East 1923, Bush and Pendel pointed to soil erosion as evidence that the country too was overpopulated. They described the New Deal as the beginning of tyranny creeping into the U.S. in response to the resource scarcity and ecosystem degradation caused by population growth. Birch and Pendel's critique of the New Deal reveals the ultimate target of their work, economic, uh, uh, economic regulation. They decried any limitations on economic activity as a violation of democracy necessitated by out-of-control population growth. Instead, they recommended that population be regulated through eugenic measures such as further restrictions on immigration, sterilization, and those they deemed unfit, and birth control for the world's poor. So, I have no idea if this is true about the New Deal, but might have to do research on that later. 
first, and Pendel called on the U.S. to impose these measures on other countries through the new United Nations. In effect, they asked the United States and the United Nations to curtail the production of the world's poor in order to protect the economic freedom of wealthy Americans. All right. Demographers pay little need to human breeding and survival, but environmental Malthusian myths and spread far and wide through the book's influence on two 1948 bestsellers, Road to Survival by uh, ornithologist William Vaux and Our Plundered Planet by Fairfield Osborne, president of New York Zoologist Society. Historians have credited these books uh, with launching the modern environmental movement and focusing it on population control. Vaux and Osborne portrayed humans as part of an ecological web dependent on their very existence on the flora and fauna with which they coexisted. They contended that human greed, which promoted the mismanagement of natural resources, had begun to destroy this web. The solutions they proposed, however, like those proposed by Bush and Pendel, privileged the regulation of production over economic or envir my, environmental regulation. Though aware of the role played by global capitalism and environmental destruction, Vaux and Osborne placed the ultimate blame not on industrial production, the capitalist impulse toward growth or insatiable consumer demands in the U.S., but on the quantity of the world's inhabitants. Reducing the number of people on the planet, they contended, would automatically reduce production and consumption with inconveniencing, without inconveniencing producers or consumers. Vaux and Osborne thereby naturalized profit-seeking and ex excessive consumption as quintessential and unavoidable human activity and blurred the distinction between inhabitants of the global north, whose productive and consumptive activities drove environmental devastation worldwide. The inhabitants of the global south, who were increasing in number more quickly but had much smaller ecological footprints. Vaux, 1948, openly acknowledged that he aimed to limit the world's poor non-white population for the benefit of wealthy Americans. In addition to reducing birth rates, he advocating increasing death rates by withholding public health measures and food aim to countries in the global south and of course africa like they're always getting they literally are always getting attacked in contrast osborne 1948 called to population control across the board and worked hard to dis distance himself from the eugenic policies espoused by his father henry fairfield osborne longtime director of the american museum of natural history despite these differences osborne and vaux came together in the 1950s to slow population growth in developing countries through conversation foundation uh conservation foundation an organization osborne founded in 1948 with the help of lawrence rockefeller grandson of the co-founder of standard oil the conservative foundation worked with the planned parenthood federation of america of which Vaux served as executive director of in the 1950s shifting the organization's focus from developing birth control technologies for American women to developing population control technologies for the rapidly growing countries of the global south. It would be difficult to overestimate the impact of Road to Survival and Our Plundered Planet on post-war environmental Malthusianism. Each solid millions of co each sold millions of copies and garnered considerable attention in the American press. Both books won awards and were widely translated. Their population analysis came from entirely from human breeding and survival and other PRB publications and was therefore at odds with contemporary research in demography. The, pop the popularity of these books, however, made them impossible for demographers to ignore. PAA President Conrad uh, Tuber devoted the dinner session of the 1949 annual meeting to the critique of Vaux and Osborne. Demography defines overpopulation. Yeah, y yes, and I imagine it's just as simple as we don't want these people, but if there's too many of the people we don't want, then it's overpopulation. Um, at least from a the a global perspective, whereas 
this would only be eugenic if you're merely talking about people in your own country. And this would be the difference, I guess. Uh, mixed with environmental concerns, apparently. Okay, hold on. When Bo and Osborne published their books, demographers were in the midst of developing their own problemization of overpopulation. It differed from Malthusian problemization the fact in, the, in that it focused on the relationship between national populations and ec economies rather than global population ecosystems, and included no concept of a natural limit to population growth. Nevertheless, as demographers and their supporters invested in slowing population growth overseas, they found that the popularity of environmental Malthusianism facilitated acceptance of their work and helped them secure support from American foundations. For that reason, they silenced their skepticism about environmental Malthusianism through, the, through most of the 1950s and 1960s. Well, because this doesn't really harm like the nation you're in, so... If it looks invisible and you're not harming your own citizens, nobody's going to care. You can just claim war on terror or, you know, just about anything. You could just post pictures of just starving African children and then be like, oh, look, we gave them bowls of beans. Aren't we nice? Okay. Demography's version of overpopulation emerged from demographic transition theory, first articulated in the early 1940s by Princeton University demographers to describe the supposedly predictable demographic consequence of modernization. Mid-20th century social scientists viewed modernity ep uh, epitomized by the United States as the pinnacle of social, political, and economic development. Uh, the terminus of a linear trajectory that all countries would eventually traverse. According to demographic transition theory, the, the supposedly universal process of modernization stimulated a brief period of population growth by re reducing death rates, but also increasing the number of people as a society would support and eventually lead to the adoption of small family norms that would halt population growth. Demographic transition theory depended on vital rate models developed by interwar statisticians, but replaced their mercantilist veneration of population growth with a modernist faith in industrialization as the source of economic growth and military might. Yeah, I really don't like how, like, we get to decide the standard. Now, of course, if it wasn't for standards of living dropping in America, I would kind of argue for this point but differently and it's right in a very vague way like it's true but you can't say it's true for through the patriot the pa you can't say it's true through the patriotic lens you just there's there's more to it than that you'd be avoiding the morals if you simply thought through it with a patriotic point of view all right by 1949, Princeton demographer Notstein, 1948, and his erstwhile colleague, Davis, 1944, had noticed that death rates were falling dramatically in some colonial territories, stimulating population growth in the absence of modernization that they expected would trigger demographic transition. If population growth outpaced economic growth, they feared these countries would never modernize. Rising population density would increase their vulnerability to natural disaster and economic shocks. In contrast to environmental Malthusians who understood overpopulation as an obsolete e excess of population relative to natural resources on a global or regional scale, demographers understood overpopulation as a condition in which population growth outpaced economic growth on a national scale. Notstein, 1944, attributed the mismatch between population growth and economic growth not to the limits of natural environment or to excess reproduction, but to the structure of global capitalism. Multinational corporations ex uh, extracted labor and resources from agricultural countries to enrich industrial nation, uh, countries by funneling profits back to the global north. Notstein 
contended these corporations prevented modernization and promoted population growth in the global south. Although Notstein did not address the natural environment, he impl implicitly challenged Vaux and Osborne's assumptions that population growth in a uh, agricultural countries of the global south drove the too rapid consumption of the earth's natural resources. Rather, in Notstein's assessment, rapacious extraction of those resources and unequal sharing of the profits therefrom uh, fueled population growth. To solve this problem, Notstein 1944 initially proposed decolonization and local control over economic development, which he expected would stimulate the growth of indigenous middle classes worldwide and thereby trigger demographic transition. He found little support for this solution within the United States, however, perhaps this was the case because environmental Malthusianism had already captured the popular imagination. Instead of further developing his demographic critique of imperialism and global capitalism, Notstein, <laughs> Notes the 1945 soon began to recommend family planning as a means of promoting economic develop, uh, development in the colonial and decolonialized world. Although most demographers aligned themselves behind Notstein's version of overpopulation, Kingsley Davis, who left Princeton for Columbia University in 1948, instead embraced environmental Malthusianism. When Osborne established the Conservation Foundation, Davis and his students were among the first recipients of research uh, funds, collaborated on articles for the Wall Street Journal that attributed starvation in the Global South to population growth and argued against allowing more immigrants into, that, into the United States on environmental grounds. Historians have cited Davis' advocacy for environmental Malthusianism along with that of some of his students as evidence that demographers generally supported environmental Malthusianism. This could have not been further from the truth. Davis' commitment to environmental Malthusianism did not bring this perspective into the demography's mainstream, but rather reflected and facilitated his uh, retreat from mainstream demography when he left Princeton. He moved even further away, both geographically and conceptually, when he relocated to UC Berkeley in 1955. Notstein, on the other hand, was the mainstream of demography. He directed Princeton's Office of Population uh, Research from its 1936 inception until 1959 and directed the UN Population Division in an interim capacity when it was established in 1947. In 1952, he teamed up with John D. Rockefeller III, oldest brother of environmentalist Lawrence Rockefeller and chairman of Rockefeller Foundation, to establish the Population Council, <laughs> a non-government, sorry, I was just laughing, like, something in the distance made me laugh, sorry, the non-governmental organization that uh, channeled money from large U.S.-based foundations into overseas family planning programs, promising to stimulate economic growth by reducing population growth, together with the Ford Foundation, with which it closely coordinated its programs. The council quickly became the largest source of funding for demography in the United States. With this funding, the council shaped demography in OPR's image, expanded it dramatically, and focused its attention on s slowing population growth in the global south. Notstein and the Population Council did not publicly challenge environmental Malthusianism, nor did they oppose its popula popularization in the 1950s. Bush died in 1951, but his life's work continued through the efforts of Hugh Everett Moore, a businessman and peace activist. Moore got interested in population when he read Vaux's Road to Survival. Following the footnotes in Bush and Pendel's Human Breeding and Survival, Moore became a supporter of PRB and a friend of Bush. Uh, during the last two years of Bush's life, Bush imparted his population anxieties to Moore. These anxieties shifted from Europe, where Bush feared that starving and displaced people would seek refuge in the United States, to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where public health measures had reduced death rates. 
portending rapid population growth. With the opening of the Cold War, Bush 1950 worried that this explosion of the world population could easily bankrupt the United States in its effort to support a large increase in population to prevent these areas from becoming communistic. He feared that the continued population growth would spark warfare, which promised further environmental devastation. Confided to Moore that if the population explosion continues, we are really already in it. The atomic explosion cannot be suppressed indefinitely. After Bush's death in 19... Oh, wait a second. Um... Actually, I'll make this a part two, guys. I will be back. Data!